The Central Church of Christ is a family-oriented congregation that believes that Jesus the Christ is the head of the church and that the Bible is right. We're comprised of a group of committed, imperfect people who are striving to walk with our Lord and Savior. Yes, Sundays at Central make a difference, but we want to ensure that we're impacting your daily lives. We're dedicated to making a difference, not only in the lives of our church family, but also in our surrounding communities. Central offers several classes, ministries, and programs for people of all ages that we're confident will fit your needs. We'd love to show you why our congregation is the right church home for you. So stop on by and join us for worship service so that you can experience how Sundays at Central make a difference. Welcome to Central Church of Christ, where Sundays at Central make a difference. Connect, encourage, engage, edify, unify, restore. Sundays at Central make a difference. Help our brothers and sisters stay connected to the fellowship at Central by joining the Vine Ministry. For more information, see Brother Randy McKinley. Keep on working for Jesus. By the grace of God, we are in phase two of our COVID-19 procedure. During this phase, social distancing is still in effect, but we're lowering it from six feet to three feet. You are still required to wear a face covering. So you must put on your mask prior to entering the building. Please remember to self-monitor for symptoms before coming to the building. If you have any symptoms, please worship from home. Thank you for continuing to work with us as we strive to keep the congregation and our visitors safe. morning, Central. Here are a few housekeeping reminders before we begin our worship service. Please remember to put electronic devices on silent, wear your mask while in the building, adhere to social distancing, follow the dismissal procedure at the end of worship service, and if you have a precious little one who may get restless, please utilize the mother's room or take them to junior worship. Central, it's time to worship. Worship, to worship, and give God all of the praise. It's time to I live in glory. And then plan in your mind, I love to praise him. All right? I'd like to stay longer than men's unlighted days and watch the fleeting changes of life on even ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I live. Dear Redeemer, there no more. 
no more to die. Oh, yes, I live, live in glory by and by. I want to be of service along this pilgrim way. to praise him. Yeah? Amen. Amen. Brother Jones, you feel like helping me this morning? All right. I love to praise him. I asked Brother Jones because he's the only one that's got a mic ready to come. <laughs> I love to praise him. I love to praise his I love to praise him. I love to praise his. I love to praise him. I love to praise his name. You know that I love to praise his holy name. Cause he's my rock and he's my rock. He's my rock, my rock. My soul is shit, and he's so weird, he's so weird, yeah, in the middle of the week, I know he'll never know, he'll never, he'll never, never, never let me down, he is a Jew, he is my Jew, you know that I have found, I sing a hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I, I love to praise his name. name. I'm singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Well, yeah, I, I love to praise his name. I'm singing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. You know that I love to praise his name. You know that I love to praise, to praise his name. Why? Because well, he's, he's my rock. Well, he's my, my rock. He's 
my rock, my rock, my sword and shield. And he's a wheel, he's a wheel. In the middle of the wheel. You know he'll never, 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 never let me down. He's just a Jew. A Jew that I found. Oh, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I love to praise his name. Oh, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I love to praise his name. Oh, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, I love to praise his name. You know that I love to praise, to praise his holy name. Oh, he's my rock, yeah. He's my rock, my rock, my sword and shield. And he's the wheel, oh, he's the wheel. He's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. I know that he'll never, he will never, 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 never let me down. Cause he's a Jew, he's my Jew, he's the Jew that I have found. I sing hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know that I, I love, love to praise his name. For sing hallelujah. 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 You know that I, I love, love to praise his name. I'm singing hallelujah. 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 You know that I, I love, love to praise his name. You know that I, I love. Amen. I want to thank Brother Parker and Brother Jones on leading us those songs, as well as the brothers that are leading us in our morning worship service. Good to see everybody this morning. Praise God. He has blessed us to come together again on another Lord's Day. But before we begin, we'd like to welcome our visitors. If we have any visitors with us this morning, we want you to know that you are our honored guests. Glad to have you with us this morning on this Lord's Day. And if you're visiting with us for the first time or you've been here before, can you raise your hand so that we can see that you get a welcomes package or a visitor's package so that we can have a record of your visit, invite you back to any and all of our services here at Central. And if you have any questions concerning the Church of Christ, we'd be more than happy to sit down with you on a one-on-one -on -one and have a Bible study, whether it's in person or on Zoom, so that you can have a clear understanding of what God will have us to do that's pleasing in his sight and also be a part of his kingdom. We want to keep the Ruperts in our prayers. We got the brothers coming forward. If you're visiting, please raise your hand and take a visitor's package. We want to keep Brother Rupert in our prayers. Brother Rupert is with his mother in Mississippi, so keep her in your prayers also. And also, Brother Rupert, he's going to spend a little bit more time in quarantine because he tested positive. So we want to keep Brother Rupert in our prayers as, as well as his helpmeet that's with him, and that's Sister Rupert. And also keep his sister, who's also helping him to attend to his mother, and she's a little weak at this time too, but we know the toll that it takes when mom is at that stage, that it could be any day. So please keep them in your prayers, as well as others who have lost a loved one. We want to keep the Blackston family, the Jackson family, 
and our prayers who have recently lost a loved one. And also those that are sick and shut in, pray for them also, and especially those who are scheduled for surgery. Surgery is not always a thing you look forward to, but sometimes when we get a certain age of things happen, we have to go in to take, have it taken care of. But we pray that you be with those who are going in for surgery, and especially for the doctors and the nurses, that everything will go well. And pray for those who are traveling also. And most of all, pray for our country. We had a point now that seemed like everything goes and anything's acceptable. But we want to trust God and keep our faith in him. Now, I'm up here not to preach. I'm up here to introduce the speaker who's going to do the preaching. Now, this is a young man. I'm calling him young man because I'm older than him. I've known him since he, he was never short. That's one thing. But I've known him since he was a young man back on Pitcher Street. I watched he and his brothers grow. And this is a young man who grew from a young man sitting on the pews over at Pitcher Street to now a preacher of a congregation. I admired his, his, his drive and his, and his love for the Lord. And then he met a young lady along the way that also stirred him up some more, you know, strengthened him up. Now, he's already tall and straight. Now he's even straighter. <laughs> and we thank God for his wife, Deanna Cook. And also his mom, who raised four boys. Now, you know, that's something when a woman can raise four, and we would call them knuckleheads, but no, they, they're young men, but four boys, and they and did an outstanding job because they're all grown, responsible men. But Brother Ricky Cook, who's the minister at the Law Church of Christ, where he labors, he's with us here today. And one thing about Brother Cook, he's one of the sons of Central. And whenever the call is of need, he does not hesitate. He's here. So at this time, we're going to stand and welcome Brother Ricky Cook, who's not a stranger, but just a son who come home to preach. So we're going to be led in a song by Brother Parker, and the next voice you hear will be that of Brother Ricky Garrett Cook. There is beyond the age of blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great mind. There is a, there is a God. He is a light like that basis. In him we live and we survive from the stop
Jesus. and foremost acknowledge to our Father and God in heaven that we are grateful for all of his love, mercy, and blessings. If you are here this morning, God has blessed you. Uh, the past three years have changed things for all of us, uh, but they have not affected all of us to the same degree. Uh, some people have been sick with COVID and are still sick. Uh, some have died, some have uh, seen their financial situations change, and to this list a whole host of things could be added. But I'm glad that God offers us true consolation in our times of trial and adversity. And when I say true consolation, I, I don't mean that uh, God calls for us to act like everything is fine and nothing bothers me. Uh, ignoring or denying our troubles is in no way helpful. Uh, God does not call us to ignore or deny our circumstances. He calls for us to trust his loving kindness and his faithfulness. One of the things that will help us to do this is remembering all that God has done uh, in our past. He has blessed us so that he may bless us again. Uh, the psalmist declares in Psalm 42 verse 11, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. For all of God's blessings, we ought to be eternally grateful. 
it's just good to be home again. Uh, if you have the blessing and the privilege of being at Central every Sunday, uh, then you may take what a blessing it is to be here for granted. Uh, but when you are away somewhere else and you get to come back, uh, you just appreciate. Uh, I think y'all still say Sundays at Central make a difference. Uh, it's just good to be home again. Uh, when Brother Rupert called and asked if I would uh, fill in for him, uh, not just because of the circumstances surrounding his mother, uh, but I have been blessed in my lifetime to take so much from this congregation. Uh, it, it's just a very small thing for me to come back and try to give something back uh, when I've been blessed to uh, receive uh, over the years. So it is just uh, our, our hearts uh, overjoyed uh, to be here this morning we want to ask if you have your copy of the Word of God, uh, however that may be, whether you were like me and you're still using the old school uh, traditional book, or if you're new school, you're using a cell phone, an iPad, or some other electronic device, uh, to join us in Job chapter 42. We want to read again there in Job 42, uh, verses 12, 16, and 17. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and a thousand she-donkeys. I believe the brother that read that last word in verse 12 read it the same way I read it, probably for the same reason. <laughs> My mother's sitting right there on the second row. Verse 16, after this lived Job an hundred and forty years and saw his sons and his sons' sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. Based on the word here recorded in Job chapter 42, we want to use this morning as a subject, happily ever after. I hope the inflection of my voice conveys to you uh, that we intend for this to be understood as a question. For on this time side of life, any story that ends and they lived happily ever after usually begins with the words, once upon a time. But as we consider the text that we have before us here in Job chapter 42, if you don't know God, it sounds like you're reading a fairy tale. Job's captivity is turned. He is blessed with twice as much as he had in the beginning. And he lives to see his children's children for four generations. When we look at Job chapter 42, let me give you a spoiler alert. The only time it will be accurately said that anyone lives happily ever after is when the saved get to heaven. I remember the apostle saying in 2 Corinthians 4 beginning at verse number 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are seen, uh, which are not seen, are eternal. 
When we look at the account of Job, and, and you need to read all 42 chapters, I believe that the account of Job is as relevant today as it has ever been. And if we were to identify uh, some of the major themes in the book of Job, surely one of the major themes would be adversity. And our current world situa situation is an adverse time. When people are openly declaring that it is good and right for them to live in a contrary manner to the will of God, we are in an adverse time. When people are chastised for saying, I believe in God, but applauded for saying, I'm an atheist, we live in an adverse time. But I pray that as God's children, we will see adversity, not as a monster to be feared, but as an opportunity and a challenge to be embraced. For may we be mindful that through our every adversity, we are kept by the restraining and sustaining hand of God. Uh, again, I hear the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 saying, there is no temptation which has taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able to bear, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. So not only is adversity one of the major themes of Job, but because Job was a servant of God, hope is also one of the major things. When we talk about Job, Job is grown folks' business. Job is one of those movies that children under 13 would be required to have parental supervision uh, to attend. The lessons we learn in Job will help us grow up in Christ Jesus. In many ways, spiritual maturity parallels that of growing up uh, as a person. I believe that we are all aware that there is a difference between a child and an adult. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, Paul declares, when I was a child, and notice he says that with a past tense, it's okay to be a child when you are a child, but for everybody at some point in my living, there ought to come a time when I speak about being a child in the past tense. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. See, I heard Brother Good say in Bible class this morning, a child thinks I should get my way all the time, and I'm going to pout if I don't. But here's some maturity from Job. You remember in Job chapter 1, we are told that uh, Job lost all of his children and all of his possessions. And, and the first thing out of Job's mouth was, Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Now, if it wasn't enough that Job had lost all of his children, See, stuff can be replaced, but you can't replace children. Satan shows up again and uh, uh, contends with God and says, the only reason Job is still faithful to you is because you haven't let me do anything to him. See, people can stand stuff happening to other people, but let me do something to Job and he will curse you to your face. And the restraining hand of God says, you can do what you want, but you can't take his life. And so you remember Satan's response to this was to strike Job with a disease from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Now, Mrs. Job had been suffering all this time too. 
And Mrs. Job says to Job, do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. Do you see what Job is up against here? I've lost all my stuff. Some of us would boo-hoo like there's no tomorrow if we lost what little stuff we have. I've lost all of my children, all at the same time in one fell swoop. And then the person who I share the closest relationship with has told me to turn my back on God. But Job was a grown-up. In Job 2, verse number 10, Job says, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. That's a grown-up talking like that. And I know Job was a grown-up, not just from what he said in chapter 2, but when you get to Job chapter 42, if you look at verse number 11, then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. I know Job was an adult, because listen to what it says in verse number 11. All the people that have been conspicuously absent during all the time of my suffering, when God turns my captivity, here they show up. Not only have they been absent during all my suffering, but they show up and have the gall to eat bread at my table. I wonder how many of us, if I had suffered, not even like Job suffered, but if I had suffered at all, and you were nowhere to be found during all the time of my suffering, but when God turns my my captivity, Here you come talking about, praise the Lord, how you doing? Job remained the same grown man that he had always been. When Job says, shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord only and not receive, the word is evil there, but, but it would be synonymous with unpleasant. Job uses grown-up language. I hope to be like Job when I grow up and become more adult-like in my adult days. I believe that when we suffer, our initial reaction, our initial hope and desire is that God will deliver us from trouble. But as I grow up, I may still desire that God deliver me from my trouble, but at some point my desire needs to become that God will be glorified however this thing works out. And my hope is that he will preserve me according to my will. And I can say like the master said, not my will, but thy will be done. When we look at the account of Job, and and you have to hang in there with God until you reach your own chapter 42, until God turns your captivity, and, and appreciate that may not be until you leave this life. But there are some lessons to be learned from Job. When I read Job's account, Job's account says to me, number one, that adversity equips us for greater adversity. Now, when I say that, appreciate that it means if I'm faithful to God through my present adversity, it builds my faith and allows God to call my name for something greater. Do you remember back in Job chapter 1 where where the Bible said there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves for the Lord and Satan came also with them? 
And the Lord said, have you beheld my servant Job? I find it interesting that God called Job's name. See, Job wasn't the only one alive then, but God can't call everybody's name. See, God can't depend on everybody to suffer faithfully. I find it interesting that God didn't call the name of Job's three friends. You remember Elihu, Bildad, and Zophar, or Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Uh, Elihu came along a little bit later. But, but rem I find it interesting God didn't call their names. For, for all that they had to say uh, of a theological nature, God didn't say, have you beheld my servant Bildad? Have you beheld my servant Eliphaz? Have you beheld my servant Zophar? He said, have you beheld my servant Job? See, God knows all of us. And God knows whose name he can call. What I would find troubling is if God could never call my name for anything. Now, I'm not saying call my name for everything. I'm not volunteering for every adversity. But, but I pray that God can call my name for something. When we look at Job's account, Job's account is about more than just what happened to Job. I, I wonder if we've come to that realization in life. My life is about more than what happens to me. And, and maybe if I understood that life is about more than what happens to me, maybe God would be able to bring some joy into my living and, and be able to use me for something more than he currently does. See, this was about more than just what was happening to Job. Not only was Job's faith put on trial, but the integrity of God was also on trial. See, Satan's accusation accused God with a form of bribery. You remember God said to Satan, have you beheld my servant Job that there's none like him? He's an upright man, one that uh, uh, eschews evil. In Job 1 in verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job fear God for not? Has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Satan says, in a word, the only reason he serves you is because you treat him so nice. You bribed him, God. If you didn't do all that you did for him, he wouldn't be faithful to you. Now, now, that's food for thought there. I, I, I wonder if it's true with any of us that we serve God only because God blesses me. A am I the kind of Christian that I can come in and sing loud and, lo uh, loud and long on Sunday when the bills are paid and my COVID test came back negative, but, but, but the kind of Christian who has questions about everything and declares that it ain't fair when it's my turn for some adversity? We can't serve God on a quid pro quo basis. You know, it's not serve God, do something to get something. We must do right because it is right. And whatever God allows, like Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And may God bless us to appreciate that the lives that we live are in some way a commentary on the God that we serve. See, as a child of God, you are his servant, his steward, and his representative. Now, if you were raised in a proper house, you probably got that pep talk from time to time when you were going out in public. You know, your parents pull you and your siblings together and say, now when we get out here, don't you embarrass me. And if you embarrass me, I'm going to embarrass you. That's if you grew up in a proper house. Well, how does my behavior embarrass my parents? Because my behavior is a commentary on how they have raised me. See, you can just listen to folk talk sometimes and tell how they've been raised. 
You know, even as an adult, you have adults that know that you still say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, to certain folk because they were raised properly. You have folk that know that when somebody gives you something, you say thank you. Or when they say thank you, you say you're welcome. You look at a young man, and if he knows to hitch his pants all the way up to his waist and put a belt on so they don't slide down so you can see his fruit of the looms, uh, you know he was raised in a proper house. Or, or, or if you see a young lady and she knows that I'm not supposed to come out looking like I'm for sale, uh, she was raised in a proper house. One of the things that will help us in our adversity is to remember. Remember what? Remember that God is able and God is faithful. To have been through something is to have the blessing of being able to look back at what God has already done. And what he has already done ought to give me courage to face the present and the future. You remember a little shepherd boy by the name of David wanted to go out and fight a giant by the name of Goliath? And do you remember what the little shepherd boy's rationale was? He remembered what God had done in the past. A bear came and took one of the sheep from the flock. A lion came and took one of the sheep from the flock. And God blessed me to grab the lion by the mane and kill him. God delivered me from the lion and the bear, and God will deliver me from this giant also. See, sometimes we just need to remember not what I'm going through right now, but what God has already brought me through that allowed me to get to right now. Remembering God gave Jeremiah hope and courage to declare the mercies of God in the face of national calamity. You remember Israel had been dragged off as slaves into Babylon? And there they were mourning, thinking that God had abandoned them. Jeremiah remembered. In, in Lamentations 3, verses 21 and 22, Jeremiah said, this I recall to my, to my mind. That means he remembered. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. What gave you hope, Jeremiah? Remembering all that God has done in the past. You know, sometimes we sing that old song, Count Your Many Blessings. You know, we can't even name everything that God is doing for us, much less all that he's done in my past. But if he hadn't done all that he had done, I wouldn't be here right now. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. See, not only do we need to remember what God has done, but we need to remember the reality of things. Jeremiah says, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. You think you're going through something? Try going through the something you're going through without the power of God to sustain you. Then you'd really be going through something. I, you know times are hard. Yeah, times are hard for everybody. You ain't said nothing that the rest of us don't know. Everybody's dealing with something. Everybody's got relatives, wayward relatives. Uh, 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 you know, every, you're not the only one that knows something about hard finances or leftovers or hand-me-downs or bad health or, or, or in-laws and outlaws or whatever your hardship may be. Everybody knows something about adversity. But I need to remember, it's God that brought me to where I am now. And if it hadn't been for God, I wouldn't have made it through the things that I made it through. Adversity equips us for greater adversity. But not only does adversity equip us for greater adversity, adversity can clarify our perspective. Do you know with our eyes is not the only vision problems that we have. Now, you, you, you can tell when people have uh, vision issues, I should say. You know, sometimes we wear glasses. Sometimes we wear contacts. And sometimes we content to just squint and act like the problem ain't me. 
But I know to sit up close because if I sit back too far, I can't see what's going on. Well, our physical vision is not the only vision that we have problems with. Sometimes we have problems with our spiritual vision. See, but adversity can help us to see better. It can help us to see not only the world around us more clearly, but it can also help us to see ourselves more clearly. For all that Job is to be admired, you know, I, I look at what Job went through and, and I say, and the worst thing he did was he want God to explain why he's going through what he's going through. I mean, he done lost all his stuff, lost all his children, has suffered a disease, and then his friends come making some evil accusations against him. And all Job did was say, I want God to explain himself. Now, now I, I say all, oh, well, well, you don't never just ask God to explain himself. See, that, that's like asking your parents why. You know, your parents tell you clean your room. Hey, look, why? They, see, that might be the last thing you remember that day. Why? Because I told you so. You made the mess, you clean it up. But in Job 42, verse 3, God says to Job, Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Now, Job learned something about himself. I'm saying I want to ask God, to explain why I'm going through what I'm going through. But I don't understand what God understands. You remember God said, look, you want to ask me some questions. Let me ask you some. Where were you when I created the world? You know, we, we want to question God's ruling of the universe. In, in Genesis 1-1, where were we? You remember Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God by himself, alone and unaided, before we were ever thought about, created the heavens and the earth. God said, Job, you want to ask me some questions. Why is it that animals uh, 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 don't need a doctor to have babies? Now, I'm paraphrasing, but, but that's what he asked him. You, you want to ask me questions. Where do I keep the snow? I didn't even know snow had a storage place. You want to ask me something. See, Job, when you know what I know, and you understand what I understand, and you can do what I do, then maybe you can ask me a question. But until then, boy, you way out of your place. Uh, you, you ever, as a child, have people tell you this is grown folks conversation? Job, you are way out of line to ask me why I'm allowing what I allow. Someone has said, the more you learn, the more you appreciate how much you don't know. <laughs> See, when we look at the things that happen in life, like Job, we come to appreciate, we must embrace the fact that we can't see what God sees. And not being able to see what God sees, we are in no pos a position to question what he does or what he allows. You know, we can't see what God sees. As a kid, I couldn't even see what my mother could see. You know, she would say, my paycheck is spent before I get it. I would, how, how, how is spent before you get it? You ain't even got the money yet. How you spent it? And, and never gave consideration. See, part of the reason it's already spent is because you and your three brothers like sleeping indoors and you like eating three square meals a day, and you like going to school with clothes on. See, that's why I spent before I get it. Now, as a child, all that got by me. Now, when I got older and had children of my own, it started to become a little more clear. See, they're, they're not some uh, a, a bank where you just go in and pull a dollar out every time you need it. And before you swipe that card, you got to put some money in the bank before you swipe. And that swipe is only as good as how much you put in when you were there. 
Even in retrospect, we may not see what God sees. There's nowhere in the entire Bible record that has ever indicated that Job became aware of the conversation that took place between God and Satan. Job never knew that God testified on his behalf. Job never knew that not only did the devil accuse you, Job, but he also accused God. But God thought enough of you to represent him by adversity. What Job did come to see is that life is bigger than any one individual. Do you know sometime I'm going through something and it really has nothing to do with me? Sometimes God is using me to be a blessing to other people. Paul wrote to the Philippians that his adversity was actually a catalyst for the spreading of the gospel. It's not about me. God wants some other people to hear the good news of Christ Jesus. In Philippians 1 verse 12, Paul says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now that's more grown folk conversation. Paul says, see, the reason God allowed me to be put in jail is because I'm going to be able to preach to some people that wouldn't hear the gospel otherwise. I'm going to stand before kings and governors. So yeah, it's not pleasant in the jail. And yeah, they, you know, the rodents running around, nibbling at your feet, and it's, it's dirty in here and all of that. Paul said, but it's bigger than me. God is using me to be a blessing to somebody else. I, I wonder which of us God could call our name and say, I can use that person in adversity to be a blessing to somebody else. If the question is asked, why does God allow his faithful servants to suffer? Paul's declaration lends clarity to our perspective. See, sometimes God lets me suffer because it ain't about me. It's about God seeing things bigger than just me. It's about God understanding that there are people all around this world and I don't want a single one of them to die in their sins. So I'm going to use you to be a blessing to somebody else. And guess what? Because I made you, I don't even have to tell you that I'm using you. I, I, I don't have to get your approval to use you. I don't even have to tell you why what happened happened but we know God is faithful. I know that whatever God allows to come my way, God has already put my faith on one side of the scales and put trouble on the other side of the scale and it always balanced out by his sustaining grace. There is a third thing from the text here uh, this morning. Not only does adversity prepare us for greater adversity? And adversity can clarify our perspective, but adversity can increase our understanding. See, Job didn't understand everything after the things relate to the, us in this account, but I believe he understood more than he had before this account. Now, let me stress that his understanding of all that happened was limited. And that's important because it says we may not understand why we go through what we go through. But if we are faithful to God, we'll understand God better. See, because I sat in worship service and sang about God being a deliverer but I really didn't understand how much of a deliverer he is until he delivered me from something. Now, I don't know why I went through what I went through. I don't know if God was trying to show me something or show somebody else something, but I understand that he's a deliverer. See, being faithful to God through adversity will open our eyes to the power of God. 
I, I believe intellectually we are aware of God's power. You know, somebody said Genesis 1-1, we know the scripture, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we believe that. We believe that God created the heavens and the earth. I even believe, like the Hebrew writer said, through faith we understand that God brought something out of nothing. Now, I don't know how he did it. I just know that he did. I just know that God stood up in the nothingness of eternity and said, let there be, and there was. Now, I'm not God, so I don't have to know how he did it. I just see the fact that he did it every time I open my eyes and look around. We are intellectually aware of his power, but we need to be personally persuaded of his power. See, when I'm persuaded of his power, do you remember Paul saying, Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer with supplica uh, supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. See, that's what I do when I'm personally persuaded of God's power. I'm not going to worry about it. My job just gave me a notice that I'm being laid off or that they're closing up operations here in the States and moving overseas. See, if I'm personally persuaded of God's power, I don't worry about that. Now, I don't act like it ain't an issue, but I ain't going to stay up at night fretting because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Now, what I need to remember is if God got me that job, he's fully capable of getting me another one. I need to remember sometimes you look back and you still don't know how God did what he did. You're just glad he did it. You look back and all you can do is say, you know, that was nothing but God. I need to remember that uh, when my adversity comes along. I need to be personally persuaded of his power. In 2 Timothy 1, verse number 12, Paul says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. See, Paul's saying, I'm personally persuaded. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. See, when I'm personally persuaded of God's power, that's when I stop worrying. God got it covered. Now, that don't mean he's going to handle it the way I ask him to handle it, but he's got it covered. That, that's why I pray, not my will, but thy will be done. It might be the will of God that I experience some turbulence. Maybe I'm going to go through some adversity. I'm just glad the restraining hand of God says your adversity is never going to be greater than your faith. And I'm going to give you a bigger portion of grace so that you can withstand it. Now, you probably like me. I'm not, yeah, you know, anybody volunteering, step forward. I'm not necessarily stepping forward. But I'm glad God got me covered when it's my turn. See, the power of God transcends his being able to remove my trouble. The power of God can sustain me in my trouble and change my sorrow to rejoicing. You remember Paul talking about his thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12? Whatever that thorn was, it bothered Paul to the point where Paul prayed three times asking the Lord to take it. Now, Paul wasn't the kind to pray about the sniffles. You know, some, some, you know, some people, every little ache and pain they have is a federal case. Now, now, for Paul to ask God three times to take it, did this the man that, you know, got stoned and was ready to go back and preach to the folk that had stoned him, the, the man who had been beat and whipped and still had more to say, Whatever that thorn was, it was putting something on him. I asked God three times to take it. And you know what God had the nerve to say? No, no, ni yet. That's Russian for no. I don't know Russian. That's just the, that's the one Russian word I know. God said no, no, no. But I'm going to give you a bigger portion of grace. Now, here's where we got to be careful. 
What if Paul had pouted and said, I don't want a bigger portion of grace. I want you to take it. See, God is not their father that if you pout long enough, he'll give in. See, if you won't take a bigger portion of grace, guess what you get? Nothing. Let's say you try to handle it by yourself. This is my will. That you suffer for my name's sake. But I created you, Paul. I can use you how I please. God created us. He can use us as he pleases. But when we learn to submit ourselves to God's will, even the things we wouldn't choose become occasions for rejoicing. It's good to be a child of God. Because if you are God's child and faithful to him, there will come a time when you'll live happily ever after. There will come a time when you can live joyfully ever after in this life. Now, I hope you know the difference between happiness and joy. See, everything about this life doesn't make me happy. But I can always have joy. If you are God's child, you can have joy now and happiness through eternity. And the thing about it is God invites everybody to become part of his family. Now, he does this by causing the gospel message to be preached, the good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and raised the third day for our justification, God requires that we hear that good news. Romans 10, 17 declares that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right. Having heard the gospel message taught, we must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John 8, 24, Jesus says, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Because we believe Jesus to be the Christ, there is a change of mind and a change of living. That's called repentance. We decide to live our lives for Christ Jesus. In Acts 17, 30, 31, the Bible says there was a time when God winked at ignorance, but now he commands that all men everywhere repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by Christ Jesus. We, we must make the confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Matthew 10, verse 32. And having confessed Jesus to be the Christ, we must be baptized in water for the remission of sins. In Acts 2.38, the first time the gospel was preached, the question had been asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, in context, they wanted to know how they made matters right with God. In Acts 2.38, Peter answered and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we go down into the waters of baptism as an obedient response to the gospel message, as a matter of grace and mercy, God washes away our sins by the blood of Christ Jesus, puts his spirit inside of us, and adds us to the church of Christ. He gives us a family to help us bear up under adversity. Perhaps you're here this morning, you want to respond to the gospel message. If this is your desire, then we bid you to come as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. You know that he, victory will help you some other to win. Fight manfully on word dark passion subdue and you just look ever to Jesus you know Jesus will carry you through why don't you ask the Savior to help because he will come 
put strength stand and key and you know that Jesus is willing to it. And you know that Jesus will carry you through to him that oh God, if I know God, God giveth the crown. I know that through faith we shall come conquer though often cast down he who is our savior our strength will renew oh you just look ever to Jesus because Jesus will carry you through so come on and act. because he will come her strength and key oh you know that Jesus oh you know that Jesus will carry you through so why don't you ask the Savior, ask him to help you and comfort, strengthen, and keep, oh, you know that Jesus, oh, you know that Jesus, he'll carry you through. He's going to give us a crown. Through faith we shall conquer. Though often cast down, He who is our Savior, our strength will renew oh you just look look to Jesus and Jesus he'll carry you through so why don't you ask him to help you he'll comfort strength and and he's going to keep you, and he is willing, he's willing to aid you, and he is going to carry you through. Yeah, yeah, and I'll give my Connect, encourage, engage, edify, Unify, restore. Sundays at Central make a difference. Help our brothers and sisters stay connected to the fellowship at Central by joining the Vine Ministry. For more information, see Brother Randy McKinley. <laughs> Taken by the love of Christ, I made a vow to give him my life at the potter's table on the potter's wheel. Mold and shape me, Lord, that I may be filled and live in memory. What you did for me. How you set me free, set me free, set me free. At dark Calvary, yeah, I want to be one of yours. I want to be a worthy vessel, a 
one that is ready. One that's ready. I want to be used by you. I want to be. I want to be a worthy vessel. Lord, I want you to do, do, do just what, what you, you want, want me to. to teach me and show me do, do, truly how to love. Do, do, just like that sacrifice do, do, from heaven above. Do, do, Perfect union had never been broken. Stronger words had never been spoken from you. It is finished. Teach me how to finish a copy of love from heaven above. Wanna live in the memory? I wanna live how you set me free. What you did set me free. Heavenly, heavenly. I want to be a worthy vessel. Want to be you? to be used by you. I want to be. I want to be a worthy vessel. I want to do, do, do. One that's ready to be used by you. Church of Christ, come on, come on, where Sundays on, at Central on, make a difference. She come on, come on, you. Stop on, this stop on, Sundays at Central make a difference. Come on, come on, stop on. 